In previous years, I was invited by the Panzer Museum Munster and the Tank Museum at Bovington. This is a bit different to my usual videos because in this case, most of the analysis was already done by officers of the Bundeswehr. Although there are quite some issues. Since I got my hands on a document from October 1990 that compares the T-72 that the Bundeswehr received from the former Nationale Volksarmee, the National People's Army, with the Leopard 1A5 from the Bundeswehr. Of course, I will provide additional commentary if I deem it necessary. By the way, for those people that like to point out that comparing tanks individually makes no sense, since in real combat single tanks usually don't engage each other, well, I would say these people miss the point of such comparisons. They give a basic idea of the capabilities of the different tanks that then again need to be put in context by crewmen, commanders and decision makers. Additionally, both the Wehrmacht and the Bundeswehr did such comparisons. The last sentence I had particularly since comments usually state that these comparisons are the result of computer games like War Thunder and World of Tanks. So for those people, Maybe stop projecting your mental capacity onto gamers. Anyway, let's go to the report. It starts with a general assessment in terms of the tank's age and respective capabilities. Both main battle tank types no longer represent the latest state of tank development. In terms of their firepower, they are classified as threat appropriate according to the respective operational principles. NATO Warshaw Pact. The main common disadvantage is insufficient armor protection to be able to fight the open tank battle in duels. The T-72 in question seems to be the T-72 Ural, so the first main production model. This is an interesting choice, since the East German Armed Forces also had the T-72M and the T-72M1. The latter had improved turret armor and both had laser rangefinders. Yet the T-72 in question was apparently also refitted with the same laser rangefinder. Additionally, according to documents from the German government, East Germany received 133 from the Soviet Union, from which this T-72 should be taken. Then 156 from Poland and 260 from Czechoslovakia. The latter two would have been T-72M or T-72M once. Well, unless I am mistaken, this also means that the regular T-72 used for this comparison was not only the weakest T-72 variant available, but also the variant with the lowest number available. As such, this seems a rather odd choice, but this could have been just circumstance. Back to the report. It states specifically that both tanks are designed around different tactical concepts, which have an influence on the technical capabilities, adding, this is to be included in a comparative evaluation. First off, let us look at the basic descriptions provided about these tanks. About the T-72 it is noted, with its three-man crew, the T-72 is optimized to reduce the size of its silhouette. Its exclusive forward line of sight is matched by its lack of reversing capability, maximum 5 km per hour. It is night blind to an astonishing degree, own reconnaissance capability with external battlefield illumination, suspectility to glare. The report continues, its site and weapon engagement capabilities are clearly designed for Warsaw Pact attack doctrine, quantity outweighs quality. Its armor protection is marginally better than the Leopard 1A5. The last sentence was added in handwriting. Well, this requires some commentary and clarification. First, the part about armor protection, the armor protection of the T-72 was clearly better than that of the Leopard 1A1. To quote Rolf Hilmes, in the design philosophy for the Leopard 1 main battle tank, a conscious decision had been made in 1956 to abandon the race between protection and ammunition effectiveness, giving the Leopard 1 relatively modest armor protection initially. The hull is regular steel, not composite armor like in the T-72. The Leopard 1 A5 had some armor upgrades compared to the base version, but generally those won't make much of a difference against tank guns. The add-on armor includes special shock mounts that would reduce damage from auto cannon fire that might damage sensors, vision devices and other important equipment. The second part is about the statement on Warsaw Pact doctrine. The trope of just throwing man and material is a rather old one and to a certain degree it is understandable if one is sitting in a trench. Yet I am not and hopefully you aren't either. Mass was important for the Warsaw Pact, although the question is on what level. Christopher Donnelly made a very interesting point. He notes that the Soviet rejected a small elite force 
in favor of mass conscription for the fact that they assumed that in war everyone would sustain massive losses. To quote, to say that the Soviets deride the concept of a small army does not of course mean that they underestimate the army's concern. They have a healthy respect for say the first British Corps or the third US Corps. They would point out however that when the first British Corps has been eroded by battle there is no second British Corps to take its place. When the Soviet Third Shock Army has been eroded in battle, there is a second wave to take its place. He further adds that the Soviet assumed that the Western countries overestimated the role of technology, like light infantry and the tank weapons. In short, Soviet tank doctrine was less about throwing mass against quality, but assuming equality in a large conflict will erode rather quickly. And that long term sustainability is the key in winning a conflict. Of course, if one is on the receiving end of the Third Shock Army, one would easily interpret this as a steamroller, because the strategic thought in force composition is not apparent in this case. Yet let us move on to the Leopard 1 A5. Here the short description is as follows. The main battle tank Leopard 1 A5 with a 4 man turret with its fire control system approximating that of the main battle tank Leopard 2 is capable of successfully conducting firefights in mobile combat during daylight and with limited visibility. Its inadequate armor protection forces it into cover in the process and makes it more suitable for defensive combat. Not much to add here besides reminding you to keep in mind Hilmer's quote that the Leopard 1 was not well armored even during its introduction. Next let us look at the key differences between the two tanks according to the report. In terms of command and coordination in combat with closed hatchet, it is noted that the C-72 has limited all-around visibility dead space 3 to 8 o'clock via vision blocks. Cannot be rotated in motion for weight force reasons. This would definitely require some explanation. I chatted about this with Tankulat and then looking at various images and other texts. I think I finally understand this quote. First off, a minor error, the dead zone should be around 4 to 8 o'clock thanks to Tankolat for pointing this out, since the vision blocks are symmetrical. This would mean 120 degree. Second, the commander's coppola is balanced enough to be turned even if the tank is moving according to Stefan Koch, a former T-72 commander. Due to the anti-aircraft gun however, there is although a dead space of 40 degree to the rear even with the turned cupola, yet that is still far from a 120 degree dead zone. But what about the rest? One might argue that this statement makes little sense since the commander's cupola can be turned. And if one looks at the Leopard's commander cupola and equipment, there are vision blocks all around the cupola as you can see in this cutaway from the Panzer Museum Monster. This means the commander does not need to turn the cupola at all. He can just turn his head inside the Leopard. On top of that, the Leopard the commander also has a 360 degree periscope to look around although the latter does not work in motion according to Stefan Koch. So from my understanding the author of the report focused more on the usability of the optics in this section. As a result the author concludes about the T-72 that the observation of the combat area and ability to stay in contact is limited. Additionally noting that the commanders have to organize the combat from the rear war position and that the battle plan must be adhered to and limits the ability to quickly react. I must add here this could be true but I assume this is mostly based on a wrong understanding of Warsaw Pact doctrine and or bias along the lines of Auftragstaktik versus Befehlstaktik, mission type tactics versus order tactics. But that is a completely new front I won't open today. So let us look at what is noted about the Leopard 1 A5. It states unrestricted all around visibility via vision blocks and with the all around sighting scope TRP. During the day 40 to 20 times zoom. Night vision via EMES, the optic systems of the Leopard 2, during night 4 times or 12 times zoom. Depending on the turret position, hence gunner and commander via an optic thermal imaging device. The second part of the sentence was added by hand. Result by day battlefield assessment and maintaining contact possible, leading from the front possible. From my understanding the Leopard 1 A5 coppola and optic systems for day operations is used as a baseline reference and the author does not really account for the fact that the T-72 cupola system with similar training could be as effective to the Leopard 1 system. 
I might be wrong here, but that is my impression, particularly after also discussing this with Tankolat. Be aware that Tankolat and I don't totally agree on this. Stefan Koch posted that there are issues with the Leopard periscope, namely that it can be used only when the tank is not moving. Additionally, the loader's hatch also limits the visibility to the left side of the tank. A big thank you here to all my supporters on Patreon and the subscribe staff for keeping the lights on on the channel. The next part is about combat and mobility. For the T-72, it is noted that the speed for moving backwards is low with a maximum of 5 km per hour. Noting that it is sufficient to move into smoke. It also notes negatively the limited visibility for the driver. Positively mentioned is that marching on roads is without issues. Another aspect mentioned is, during combat, the highest level of routine and strength is required of the driver. Stefan Koch disagrees, stating, Begin of quote, the driver of the T-72 would have to use extensive force to steer and operate, end quote. I don't understand. Pulling a steering lever only turns a hydraulic valve. The force is generated by a spring, so resistance is artificially created. You can adjust the spring yourself. This indicates a major misunderstanding of the report when it comes to the T-72. One of the results the report notes is the following. On the battlefield, it drives exclusively forward, turning maneuvers are necessary at each evasive movement. Now I did not understand this at first, so I asked around. Thankfully Kampfmit Kette and Tobias explained it to me. Since the reverse speed is so slow, the driver tends to use only forward movement in combination with turning, which can lead to some serious issues like exposing the weaker armor to the enemy. For the Leopard 1 A5, it is noted that it is very capable in that regard. The next part is about combat. There are various points mentioned about the T-72, I will focus on the controversial points. It is noted that the only 8-fold magnification of the target optics and inaccurate weapon stabilization and the double aiming, laser e-measurement, target sight limit the firefight from the position to 1500 meters, from the uniform movement to 1000 meters. The firing sequence is determined not by the good autoloader, but by the time required to readjust the gun sight, no shot observation, to about 15 to 20 seconds. Stefan Koch noted that the distance of a maximum of 1500 meters seems to be out of place and this is a rather low value. He agrees that firing at moving targets can be an issue. He added, something else about the effective range of the tank gun. We shot while moving at 15 to 20 km per hour, target in 11 to 13 o'clock, at distances between 1600 to 1800 meters with a high probability of scoring a hit. And that with high explosive fragmentation. How the report comes to a maximum of 1000 meters is questionable. We are aware that high explosive rounds are generally slower, as such they have a wider trajectory and are generally less accurate. About the 15 to 20 seconds delay between the shots, he notes that this makes no sense to him. He agrees that the fire control system of the T-72 is dated. Interestingly enough, the report notes that the ammunition of the T-72 was excellent whereas Tankolat notes that East Germany did not have access to particularly good ammunition. So again we have various points that don't add up. In terms of combat for the Leopard 1A5, it was noted among other things that optical equipment during day 12 times magnification, night 4 and 12 times magnification, all around sighting scope TRP T4 and 20 times magnification and high quality of firing control system close to the Leopard 2 level enable firefight at long combat range during movement and in rapid succession of fire during day and night. It added that the resilience of the optics was weaker compared to the T-72, yet more precise. As a concluding remark in this section, it was noted that the T-72 is mostly optimized for the attack, but not the delay or defense. Meanwhile, the Leopard 1 A5 is suited for all types of combat Although also noting that due to the focus on precision, technical reliability is lowered. The next part is about crew coordination, particularly the commander and gunner. For the T-72 it is noted that besides a rough target assignment to the gunner, there is no other mutual support action. The loss of one crew member results in the collapse of the combat effectiveness. Keep in mind that the T-72 only has three crew members. For the Leopard 1A5, the report states, Gunner and commander complement each other in the firefighting, target reconnaissance, combat speed. 
The firefight can also be led from the commander's position. The loss of a crew member can be compensated for a limited time. Nothing to add from my side. The report concludes that the T-72 is not an adequate replacement for the Leopard 1A5 due to its limited versatility, particularly its limited night fighting capability, dated fire control systems and issue with mobility in terms of reverse speed. Of course, its limited suitability for Auftragstaktik is also mentioned, but as stated previously, this is debatable. To summarize, as pointed out, there were several errors when it comes to the assessment of the T-72. I suspect the reasons of these errors might be twofold. First, some aspects likely come down to limited familiarity with the T-72, too much experience with the Leopard, which results in using as a standard baseline and some good old Cold War bias. On the other hand, the assessment of the Leopard 1A5 seems to be spot on. Second, this one is highly speculative, yet particularly looking at the final conclusion one must ask a question if the intention of the report was to avoid at all cost that some politician and or bureaucrat might seriously push the idea to introduce the T-72 in the Bundeswehr. Keep in mind that the Cold War was over and that the Bundeswehr had a lot of tanks left at that point, quite contrary to the current situation. Now I don't know how competent German politicians and bureaucrats were back then, but if some of the current ones can be taken as a yardstick, while the various statements that seem wrong in this report are understandable under these circumstances. I hope you learned something new. Thanks to Tobias and Tankolat for answering various of my questions and pointing out issues with the report. Thanks to Cathy for discussing the variants and pointing me to the source. Thanks to Andrew for reviewing the script and providing feedback. Thanks to Tank Arrow for his insights on Wash or Pack Doctrine. Beware, any errors are my own. Also only Andrew saw the complete script. Thank you to the Panzer Museum Monster and the Tank Museum at Bovington for inviting me in the past years. Special thanks to all my supporters for making trips to museum and military archives possible. As always, sources are listed in the description. Thank you for watching and see you next time.